Good morning, Open Door. Hey. Wow. Uh, we are in Romans 6, 15 to 23 today. If you want to turn in your phones or your... Don't turn in your phones. Do turn on your phones. <clears throat> wow, I feel like... Uh, I was telling the first service that we should have a bottle of champagne to christen this new podium on her maiden voyage. I think it's an amazing piece. Uh, you wouldn't know, but there's, there are pen holders here. There's little medication slots. There's one for tramadol right here. It's amazing. I told John, I don't, don't let the size of this podium encourage you for a vo- more voluminous messages. Uh, just keep it tight. But this is a great thing. Um, you know... Last time I spoke, two-thirds of the elders were not here. They just took off. And then this morning, two-thirds of the women are not here. And so I'm not complaining about that. I'm just, I'm just sensing an opportunity that next time we might just do an interactive Bible study in the conference room. And, wow. Um, thank you, worship team. I just so appreciate um, we need that music worship for healing, for comfort, for courage, for all kinds of things. And it's a very appropriate time for us to remember that in a cultural storm, uh, the winds and the waves still know his name. Uh, And he will take us through it all. Um, A few years ago, I was speaking at a conference in Hilton Head with the beloved psychologist Larry Crabb and the remarkable former priest, uh, Brennan Manning. And um, it's when, at that time, that Brennan said, put bluntly, the American church today accepts grace in theory, but denies it in practice. We say we believe that the fundamental structure of reality is grace, not works. But our lives refute our faith. By and large, the gospel of grace is neither proclaimed, he said, understood, nor lived. By and large. Those are powerful words. I never forgot them, but I was distracted at the moment because I realized that the three of us had another conference to do in that same venue the next year. And I thought, you know what? Uh, Lynch, he, he loves the ragamuffin gospel by Brennan. I got to get him here somehow. So I talked to the conference convener and I said, you know, I'd like to bring my buddy with me next time. And he was hesitant. And uh, <clears throat> wasn't sure about this Lynch guy. And so <clears throat> finally we agreed. He said, if you pay for him, uh, he can come. I said, well, you'd be glad I paid for him. Because I said, he and Brennan are going to have an out-of-control hoot, just skipping down the beach and, and preaching God's grace to other people. And they did. And I wives got to come. It was a wonderful time. And now Brennan, he's already graduated. So he, I can only imagine Given Brennan what a bold and audacious adventure he's going on with Jesus. I, I cannot imagine um, anything more wild than this wonderful man of God. Uh, but listen to these words again. Put bluntly, our lives refute our faith. We say it, but we deny it in practice. And by and large, the gospel of grace is not proclaimed, understood, nor lived. And that's the importance of our series in Romans. Um, So uh, today's text is full of uh, some some fresh hope um, because it helps us not be so concerned about our behaviors, so scared of our shortcomings, of of some of our assumptions on our circumstances. It, It helps us to distinguish or discern a little better than we might have done before when another gospel is being published or preached or pushed on us, or if we're pushing it on ourselves and we're just uh, blindly taking it in. It's very helpful. And I want to speak a little bit today. We get time on grace and addiction. So, as has been our habit, uh, let's stand and read these scriptures together in Romans 6, 15 to 23. 15. What then shall we say... Not under law, but under grace, by no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, 
You are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. Did you happen to notice while you were reading all the references to obey and obedience and uh, offering yourselves, which is just a synonym phrase for obedience? You see that? You see what's going on? We uh, finally are making this transition from the foundation into some practice now. And today we get to talk about this grand word, obedience. Tremendous word. The Bible says that Jesus was obedient, and he was even obedient unto death. And it also says that he mysteriously learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Fascinating. You could take a whole morning on that. And last week, our last chapter, Romans 5, we learned that by one man's disobedience, a bunch of mayhem took place in everyone's life. Obedience of another man, Jesus, that we were justified and reconciled and made righteous and holy. It's powerful. Obedience is powerful. This is a huge deal that we get to talk about today, obedience. And to kind of help us lay some groundwork uh, for obedience, we just need to remember two things about the foundation. And one of those things is <clears throat> truth number one out of verse 15 and 16 is that the law inspires me to sin, but grace empowers me to obey. That's an interesting thing. You see what Paul's doing here? He's doing the same thing he did in verse 1. He's giving the critics another chance to object and to say, so, you're going to do away with the law? Then what should we say? Are we going to sin some more? Because, you know, it was a law that kept us in sin, and Paul's saying, well, what are you thinking? You know by this time that the law does not inspire you to obey. It inspires you to sin. That's part of why God gave you the law, so that you would know that you didn't have the ability. It's only grace that empowers us to obey. Willpower is like no power when it comes to sin. And so Paul is giving them their chance, but he's saying, you know, this was already settled a few verses ago. I'm going to give it to you again. The second thing that you need to know, if you're going to know that grace empowers you to, to obey, is that every person who is born is born a slave to sin. Every person. And every person who is born again is born again a slave to righteousness. So there are no exceptions. There are no other kinds of humans. Everybody is a slave. Either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. And he's pushing that point home through a variety of verses. The only question he's asking is, whose slave am I? That's the important part. You belong to one master. Like Jesus said, you, you can't serve two masters. You serve one master or the other. You're slave to sin, slave to righteousness. So Paul uses this picture that's kind of, it's kind of a sensitive metaphor. In fact, I asked some of my African-American friends how they would preach this passage. And it was different than the way I would preach it. Because it's a sensitive metaphor in our culture and in many cultures around the world today. Paul knew that too, but he uses the metaphor because everyone in Rome almost was either a slave or a slave master. And so they understood this metaphor. He's trying to get them to understand something they don't know about from something they do know about. And all you school teachers, you probably used this all last week. You went from what the student knows to what the student doesn't know. In this case, the student knows about slavery. 
but they don't know about righteousness. And they don't know about where obedience comes from. So he's going to lay that down in such a way that everybody gets a chance to understand it. It's really hard to understand some of these things that we've been learning, right? I, I don't understand all these things. I just see them clearly spoken and written, and then I get a chance to trust or not. That's the whole ballgame. So it's not a matter of do I understand all of this. It's a matter of can I see this clearly and can I trust it? And so you see Paul pushing on this uh, time and again. And so I thought I'd make a little chart for you where you could just kind of see a sample of these verses coming together and what it was like before Christ and what it's like in Christ. So in verse 16, he says, you're slaves to sin. In verse 17, he said, you used to be slaves to sin. That was your former condition. In 18, he says, you've been set free from sin. Remember, there was a time when you were not set free from sin. You were a slave to sin. And then he says, you were slaves to sin. So he's saying before Christ, that was your condition. In Christ, verse 18, you have become slaves to righteousness. In Christ, verse 19, now you can offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness. And then in verse 22, he says, you've been set free now from sin. And then in verse 22 again, he says, so you have become slaves of God. See how he's trying to push on that? And the key to understanding this is that you will experience who you are. So if you're, as Ephesians 2 says, if you're dead in your trespasses and sin, if you're a slave to sin, you're going to experience episodes of death. If you are a slave of righteousness and you are alive in Christ, you are going to experience episodes, uh, verse 16, of righteousness, verse 19, of holiness, verse 22 and 23, of life. You will experience who you are. So he's just trying to drive that home as a foundation before he gets into this obedience. And some people will ask, you know, how can I be a slave of righteousness if I mess up so much? How, how does that work? And there we go again, don't we? We, we? we start making Christianity about behavior, and we slide off the foundation of what we've been learning in Romans 3 through 5 and 6. See, Paul knows that our sinfulness runs deeper than our law-breaking behavior, and so the solution has to run deeper as well, and it does. In, in Romans 7, you're going to see a seasoned Christian who is wrestling with unruly behavior in his life. And he happens to be the one who says, you're set free from sin. So how does that work? How, how does he figure that out? Part of what Paul knows is that when we became slaves to righteousness, we received a never-before experience, an ability to choose. When we were slave to sin, we had no ability to choose. We were slave to sin, and we were going to have those experiences of death. But now we have an ability to choose. However, with that ability to choose, I can live out of who I am in my identity, who I am now as a, a slave to righteousness in Christ, or I can live out of the flesh with its active sin still in me. That's part of my anthropology. That's part of who I am. I can live out of that. So I have a choice. I have the ability that I didn't have the ability before to make that choice. Some people think that, you know, this is a scary proposition, this, this war between the kingdoms, so I'll just stay in the middle. Huh. There's no middle. There's no DMZ, as Stuart would say. There's no demilitarized zone. You are either a slave submitting yourselves, offering yourselves as a slave to righteousness, or you're not, and you're offering yourself to addiction, compulsiveness, sin, other things that are active in, in us. Okay? Now, it's really important at this point to come back to a definition that we looked at maybe, I don't know, two, three weeks ago, and that is this issue of the flesh. It's not our ID, it's not our identity, it's not our DNA, but we still have flesh in us, and it is the capacity to live life apart from God and the desperate desire to control to make life work without him. The flesh cannot be subdued by self-discipline or self-effort. And it continues to try to control even after we've been made new in Christ. 
Only by trusting God and his people can we have victory from the flesh and walk in newness of life that is our birthright in Christ. So we are dead to sin, but it appears that sin is not dead to us. One of the most helpful questions at this point on obedience, since that's what this text is about, is what makes it possible for me to obey? What, in, a, in a practical way, what, what could help me obey in a way that I didn't before and had no choice to before? So there are three things, and I put them in the negatives because I think, for me, in my life, they're a little bit easier to remember. And this first one is really off of verse 17. Don't forget you have a new heart. Don't forget that. Romans 6.17 says this. It's an amazing verse. Thanks, God, because through God, while we used to be slaves to sin, we have come to obey from the heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed our allegiance. Come to obey from the heart. How big do you think this is? This is a huge verse, by the way. Some people think this Romans 6.17 is to the Christian what John 3.16 is the person who is not a Christian who has not met Jesus yet. It is a big verse. So you want to hang on to this, Romans 6.17. What this verse is saying is that you can actually now obey from the heart because you have a new heart. It's no longer Jeremiah 17.9. You remember that verse. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. And there you get a hint as to why Jesus gave you a new heart because your old heart was beyond cure. No bypasses, no stents, nothing. You know, you need a new heart. And he gave you this new heart so that your idea would no longer be deceitful. You no longer see yourself as a helpless victim of sin because now your strongest impulse is to do right. You've been made right. Now you have this opportunity to be a slave to righteousness. There's another prophet beyond Jeremiah who speaks well to this. Ezekiel precisely and accurately prophesied what was going to happen to all of us who trusted Jesus. And he said this in Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart. Quoting God, <clears throat> with new and right desires, I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your old stony heart of sin, and I will give you a new, catch this word, obedient heart. You know why you can obey? Because you have a new, obedient heart. It's an amazing thing. You don't gradually get better at obeying and then kind of morph into a new heart. No, you... You've been given a new heart. That's the miracle and the beauty of Jesus and the gospel. You've been given a new heart so that gradually you could mature into who you already are. It is an amazing thing. That's why you can obey. Um, verse 19 and 22 are speaking specifically to that, that you will have experiences of holiness and righteousness and 23, life, as you mature into who God has made you. So that's the first thing. Don't forget, that's a foundational thing that you have a new heart. The second thing is, don't get trust and obey backwards. It's easy for us to do. Um, in the late 19th century, there was a meeting that uh, Dwight Moody held. And there was a young guy at this meeting, and he was telling his story afterwards, and it was obvious that he just brand new. He just met Jesus. And he didn't know much of the Bible. But the words that he spoke right at the end of his story just shattered everyone. Um, he said, I'm not sure how this works, but what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to trust, and then I'm going to obey. And, you know, you think, how simple is that? Well, the worship leader and his friend, who was a lyricist, they were astounded at this. And so they went out and produced a, a hymn that became a global confirmation of Romans 6, the original good news, called Trust and Obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. In the first chapter of Romans, chapter 1 and chapter 16, the last chapter, there is a phrase used, the same phrase. And God is saying through Paul that we have an obedience of faith. Some say an obedience in faith. It's an obedience that is sourced in faith. It cannot be reversed. If you reverse it, you do what all the major world religions do. 
They want to obey so that God gets happy with them so that then they can trust that that God will not be so mean to them, will not punish them, so they don't have to be distant from that. Christianity says, no, we just act, we're going to reverse that. It's going to be trust and obey. When we get these backwards, all kinds of things happen to us that are needless and are tragic. So what do you think happens if you obey and trust, if you try to do it that way? You know, there's so many things, we can't even have time to mention them all. And, and they have devastating consequences on us. We just don't think about it very often. But one of the things is, when you obey and then you think you're going to trust, you don't get to trust. Because you're all the time looking at yourself and going, man, my, I'm, I'm depending on my effort and my behavior and my striving to get God and me in a good position with each other. And God's going, no, I already want you to depend on my son's behavior, on his obedience, so you can trust that so that your behavior can change over time because I'm going to give you a new heart if you just trust that. Another thing that happens when we reverse these two is we don't listen real well because we're so focused on figuring out what we think we should do, we forgot to listen. Oh, God, you, you always said that disobedience is rooted in trust. Humility. Humility's always got trust in it. So if it's rooted that way and you reverse it, you miss the trust and you miss the ability to hear him and have an intimate relationship with him when all the time that's, that's what he purchased for you. So it's, it, you know, it's a great gift that goes unwrapped. So what's he want us to trust? Well, he wants us to trust who he says he is, who he says you are. He wants us to trust his worldview. He wants us to trust that it is possible to leave the consequences with him when we trust and obey. So, and I come back to that, but this leads to the third thing, and that is don't get the wrong permission. So here I want to talk a little bit about addiction because that's what's happening in verse 19 where you see ever-increasing, ever-more-frequent wickedness. What is that? Oh, that's, that's just our shame-driven compulsions, uh, addictions. So um, can Christians really be addicted if they're slaves to righteousness? What do you think? Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, sure can. They say, well, how does that work? Well, if we're slaves to righteousness, how can we be addicted? And remember, don't, don't lock in addictions to just alcohol and narcotics and so forth. No, you can, you can spread those addictions out to all kinds of things, like having to be right, like unrepentance, like uh, unforgiveness, like uh, fantasies, like manipulation, like always having to be the center of uh, attention, like bitterness, like anger, like sex, like manipulation of, of, of different uh, relationships in our lives, like gossip and lying. And there's uh, just a whole nice list of addictions. Can Christians be addicted? Oh, absolutely. Now we see we get to the point of where a lot of this addiction comes from. Because we give ourselves the wrong permission. We give permission to ourselves, to trust ourselves, that we're going to work it out. And then we get into a dark spot, which is kind of like a Petri dish of compulsiveness. And we think we're going to make that happen, and it doesn't happen for us. Instead, get rid of that permission and give permission to God and others with you, with your life. It's a very simple thing and a, a, a thing that we often forget. That, oh... When I want to be a slave to righteousness and obey, but I'm having a struggle doing that in whatever area, I need to trust some other people with me so I can get my compass right again because usually it's spinning. Think about um, if, if that's true, if a slave to righteousness can be an addict to something and needs other people, needs the right permission, then here's the other side of it. How do you think that people who don't know Jesus, who are slaves to sin, can do beautiful things, sacrificial, loving things for people all their lives? They're slaves to sin. It says it leads to death. So how do they get to do all these beautiful things for people? Do you ever think about that? Oh, my goodness. That is, a, that is a puzzle that Paul is working on in this text. So... 
one of the things that, that, where we get trapped in answering that question is back to behavior. Don't make it about behavior. Good or bad behavior. It's not about behavior. The answer to that question is not about good or bad behavior. A week ago, Janet and I and our youngest son, Ryan, were watching a Netflix um, film on a current guru who is brilliant and does some amazing things to help people get unstuck from their situations and put them in a place they never thought they could be. It's just absolutely astounding what he can do. He doesn't know Jesus, but he knows all kinds of wonderful processes to help people in their lives. And it often, quote, works. However, Isaiah is saying this. All these prophets are coming back. Isaiah 64, he's saying, now look, when he speaks for God, he said, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our great righteous acts are like filthy rags to God. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. We are all slaves of sin. So how does a slave to sin do such loving and life-altering things? Why? I was (laughs) hoping there was an answer here. We, We need to remember that everyone who is born a slave to sin is also born in the image of what? Of God. And this is his common grace. Now, just because a person is totally depraved doesn't mean that they're totally, in every way, tarnished and damaged so that they can't function in that image of God. Total depravity simply means that you're tarnished and damaged in every part of your being and that you're a slave to sin. That you can also then do acts of love and sacrifice for other people. But we have no way to make that choice. We have no way to obey outside of Christ. We are still a slave to sin. We cannot obey from the heart because the heart is still deceitful. And uh, it just reminded me of last week when I was uh, in line at a uh, New York City airport, JFK. And there's this desperate young couple who had currency from, I think, Estonia, but uh, it didn't work in JFK. And they were on their way home. Their plane was about to take off. And they were desperately hungry, and I got to buy a meal for them. But anybody in the line, Christian or not Christian, they could buy a meal for them. We can all do these acts of good service. It's called God's common grace. But it's when we become a slave to righteousness that we learn about saving grace, and we learn that he gives us a new heart. And that's when all the obedience, not based on whether or not we become godly because we do something. No, we're already made godly. We're already made holy so that we can do acts of obedience. Very important not to get trapped in our behavior. Sometimes people will ask, so what, do, what does this grace give me to do? What is, is it just trust? No, there, there is the obey part. So there's plenty of good things that you get to do. And a lot of times when we're thinking about obedience, um, we're thinking about ourselves and the benefit that we'll get from obedience. But you know what? Most of your obedience, just like the obedience of Jesus, is meant for other people. And if you continue to offer yourself as a slave to righteousness, you will bless hundreds of people through your lifetime. It's a a, a wonderful thing. And perhaps God is asking you to do something right now, to trust him on something that is difficult. And uh, I'm, I'm in that position just right now. And so what we want to do is, this is what we want to do. We want to figure out what will be the consequences, the results of this risky obedience that I know he's asking me to trust him for. And he's going, no, you just trust, then you obey, and I'll be responsible for the consequences, for the benefits. And if you continue in that pattern, you will see that you will lavish benefits of eternal life on many people throughout your lifetime. It is, it is unimaginable what he does for us. This is how um, the psychiatrist Gerald May uh, sees grace as the most powerful force in the universe. Because he knows that Jesus is at the heart of this, he says it will transcend repression, addiction, and every other internal or external power that seeks to oppress the freedom of the human heart. 
It's because we have a new heart, verse 17. And it's because we get to trust and obey. When I, I was a new Christian in grade seven, um, a teacher, a school teacher, um, she knew that I was, she was Christian. She knew I was wrestling with uh, not thinking that I was good enough to do certain things. I wasn't uh, pleasing God enough. And I was, it told her I felt like a slug some days because I, I was from Oregon and um, we knew about slugs. And um, she said, well, let me give you a different metaphor. Let me talk to you about a caterpillar and a butterfly. And that's when I got introduced to that, that metaphor where he, she says, you know, you may feel like you're crawling, but you have the DNA of a butterfly. And that's who you actually are. And you are going to soar into that. You're going to get to fly more and more and more. And so she said, I would advise you to start enjoying life today. And don't be waiting until you're good enough to fly. So in our master bedroom, Janet and I see this about every day. We have this multimedia arts picture in there because I want to remember the scriptures of Romans 6 that tell me I have a new DNA. I have a new righteousness, a new holiness, and I'm made to fly. I'm made to be, as you see it there, I'm made to be free. Uh, I am made to trust the truth which will set me free. And I am made for the freedom for which Christ set me free. If I trust it, if I obey it, and if I give permission to others when I lose it, and I can't, can't find my way. Which reminds me of a poet from the 18th century that describes Romans 6 perfectly. To run and work, the law commands, yet gives me neither feet nor hands. A sweeter thing the gospel brings, it bids me fly and gives me wings. That's amazing. Let's thank Jesus for that right now. Lord Jesus, I...